guys, welcome back to the PHBC Pastors Podcast. So glad you guys are joining us again. Um, we're happy to be back. Took a few weeks off for New Year's and Christmas, and I got to be in quarantine for a while, so that was always fun. Best part about quarantine is it's free family counseling. Like you just get it all in one fell swoop. So, uh, but no, glad to be back. Uh, this week we're going to talk about the three sets of sermons that Gibson walking through. Um, he'll actually do the third one this week. Um, so if you listen to this, maybe give a little sneak peek. Yeah. It's like, Not everything, though. Yeah. <laughs> Save a few nuggets. <laughs> that way you have to come. Right? Try. you got to listen. Yeah. Uh, I know. I know. Leave me uh, a cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah, that's all the time we have for this week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the next week, we've actually got a question we're going to talk about. We'll talk about that at the end of the podcast today. But um, we're going to jump right into this. So there's three words that, that we've kind of been talking about. Um, humble, holy, and healthy. And at the core of this... Um, it's just kind of how we want to look at this new year. You know, I think you hear all kinds of things when the new year starts. Obviously, gym memberships are like quadrupled and, you know, everybody has these goals and they have New Year's resolutions, new year, new you, whatever you want to call it. Um, but when it comes to our church and really just what it means to be a Christian and walk into a new year, new situation, um, I think these three words really encapsulate what the point of that is and you know, what are we trying to get at. So uh, for each word, we'll read a, a passage of scripture and then we're just going to chat about it for about 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll get moving. So let me, let me start. Um, the word is humble. And this is Lamentations 3, uh, verses 21 through 25. It says, But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good for those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. So when you think of being humble, um, what is at the heart of that? Guys? The word I used in the sermon for several different, you know, illustrations was the word prerequisite, which really prerequisite is like what comes first. And to me, mm-hmm. humility mm-hmm. comes first in this. And so this is Jeremiah speaking about, um, you know, a very hopeful situation, a very encouraging description of what the Lord has done. But you have to take it in context of all the verses that go before it. It's a, it's a dark, gloomy description of the fallenness of Israel and their hard-headedness, their continual rebellion. A lot of deep, dark words like waste away, um, change or heavy, desolate, laughing stock, bitterness. All of that is what Jeremiah kind of basks in for a moment. And then he says, but this I call to mind and have hope. And I think that's the condition of every human being, right? Apart from Christ. It's not good, right? It's desolate, it's fallen, it's broken, it's it's just depravity. And so uh, humility is the beginning of understanding the grace of God. And so we have to we have to understand that. But humility is also the beginning of growth, right? It's, it's the ongoing uh, humility that provides us the opportunity to say what Jeremiah said and say, you know, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Mm. Uh, therefore, I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to seek the Lord. Um, if we don't have humility, we don't get to that point. If we think we have the ability to provide something or to do something or earn something, then we've missed the point. Or if we think that uh, you know tomorrow we're going to be a better version of ourselves than we are today apart from the Lord, it's like that's that's not possible. The Lord's mercies are new every morning. And so for me, I just wanted to, in the sermon, drive home that point that if, if you've not humbled yourself before the Lord, if you, if you can't look at a time in your life where you have fully understood your fallenness and then allowed that to be, um, kind of the prerequisite for understanding the mercy of the Lord, then I think you're, you're still just in a religious system or or not. I mean, you're either in a religious system or you're just often self-reliant. It's one of the two. You're not in a passionate relationship with the Lord apart from the humility we see on display here from Jeremiah. Yeah, I think I think you said it, the word, you know, like self-reliant, you mm-hmm. know, and like as you shared that sermon um, a couple weeks ago and just through my just reading, you know, the the question of or the truth of like man like do I see my need for God mm-hmm. you know and, and I think like those verses show that and again through my reading I've been reading like Luke 7 and um, you know th- that's the you know the story when Jesus was uh, in the house of the Pharisees and they're, they're, they're at the table and then the prostitute woman like comes to the door and like just bows down and worships and and like you know, washes it anoints his feet with her hair and it's this like clear indication of like here's a broken person who heard about Jesus and did what she needed to do to go find him and expressing like her her need for him because she like you said like 
she understands her brokenness and she understands, man, like, this is God, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think it's interesting because it's like in that moment, like seconds after, like he's rebuking the Pharisees because it's like they're not approaching him in that way at all, yeah. you know? And so, I don't know, I, I just, just thinking about like, man, my need for God, like what does that mean? Like what does it mean to be humble? Um, you know, I think it's centered around like, you know, beginning to like relent my life to God, you know, to um, stop going my own way. Like you said, self-reliant, I think like to almost stop like selfishly protecting myself, you know, if that makes sense. Right. Like, yeah, I think for me, it's so funny because, I mean, obviously you guys know me, like my character is very like soft and like tender, but like underneath that there's a lot of like well i just don't want to get hurt like i just don't want people to be mad at me i don't want people to not like me i don't want you know this is very very focused on myself and so um again there, there's such a, a difference between like god's definition and the world's definition of humble right because god would say hey to be humble means come like cling on to me stop clinging on to yourself or idols or whatever like really like lay your life down for me and um I don't know, man. I just I love that image of Luke seven, and that's been on my heart a lot. Mm. You know, I'm just thinking about like my own like prayer life. Like, does my prayer life kind of match up to Luke seven? Right, and the the way that I pray, am I like like seeing and expressing my need yeah. for God? You know, and I, I mean, I love I love what you said to you about a prerequisite. You know, yeah. that's that's so key. You know, and it's something that um, even as like believers for a long time or whatever. Like, we can never lose that fact, right, that we need God. Yeah, I like the way you describe that as as the need for God is the definition of humility. Really, it really is. And I think, you know, it's all through the Scriptures. I mean, it's all through the life of Christ. Humility just flowed out of Him. And then genuine believers that are on display in Scripture, humility was kind of one of the prime characteristics. And I'll be honest, it's one of the hardest things to point out in our life if it's not present. You know, because we've said before in this podcast that, there's a ton of like blatant, sinful, wayward acts that if we saw them from a mile away, it's like, well, that's not right. You know, work on that. But but humility is not one of those things. Like it can be shrouded in you know things that we actually applaud if we're not careful. Like yeah. like the more self reliant you are, the more capable you are, especially in the church, the more we're probably going to applaud you and like you know respect you. Whereas yeah. a lot of that might be lack of humility. Actually, you know, maybe a lack of of like you said, just depending on the Lord, yeah. feeling your need for Him. Like I don't know. I, I thought a lot about. Humility being the same as being hopeful in what Jeremiah said here. Like he talks mm-hmm. a lot about hope, and that's the idea of humility is not like self deprivation. It's saying, I'm going to make myself less because Christ is more. Like John the Baptist said, it's really this idea of I'm hopeful and believing in what Christ has done and what God is bringing about. And therefore, it's not about me. And so I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to empty myself because I'm hopeful that there's something much greater than me. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I think we can miss that if we're not careful and, and not even feel the the the, um, the the reality of that, right? We could say, well, yeah, but I'm just trying to be a good person. I'm just working hard. I'm just trying to accomplish things. And the end of the day, like, no, you're just trying to do be self-reliant is what you're doing. Yeah. You're just trying to not have to humble yourself and trust the Lord. So I don't know. I've just been convicted of that a lot lately in a, in a very positive way. It's very freeing and liberating to say, you know, I'm just going to trust the Lord. I'm going to empty myself and trust Him. Like you said, I'm going to feel my need for Him because as Jeremiah says, it's in that moment that I can say, therefore, I remember and have hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. And as, as Peter's finishing his letter, he says, this First Peter 5, 6, he says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you. Which I love, and it makes a lot of sense, but I, he ties it together in verse 7 by saying, casting all your anxieties on him because he cared for you. And that caught me as I was kind of getting ready for this today, was Peter ties humbleness to what are you doing with the things that, that make you anxious mm. you know like are you going to be a humble person and get rid of that anxiety because you're going to humble yourself to the point where you realize you can't do anything about it anyway yeah. it's like when i think of being humble that's not what i think about like honestly i think like humble people are probably pretty anxious because they're you know they're trying to be real meek or like you said like mm-hmm. they're trying to be real soft um, but that's not how peter thinks about it obviously like he's thinking you need to humble yourself to the point that any anxiety you have you give it to the lord because He's good. Right? The yeah. steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Right. So true humility is being able to say, like, I don't have anything to be anxious about. Yeah. He really is in control of all things. And I think that, you know, those two ideas coming together, like you said, I think it's what makes it so hard for me is 
I like to think, well, if I'm anxious about something, that just means I care, uh, you know, or if I, if I can't get something off my mind at night, that just means it really matters to me. Well, what I might really mean is I'm not humble. Like yeah. I really think like I've got to get up tomorrow and I've got to fix this thing. Mm -hmm. I've got to go in there and I've got to have this conversation and I've got to do this thing. Uh, not to say that you don't have to do something about it, just to say that you think you sitting up at night or sitting over there fretting over it for two hours is going to change what God wants to do with it. So, uh, Absolutely. Anything else? Good? Good stuff. All right. Uh, so the next word is holy. Holy. I think this is another one of those words that can kind of be like a loaded term. You know, when you hear the word holy, you think of a lot of different things. Um, but for this word, we're going to read Psalm 1, uh, verses 1 through 6. It said, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish." Um, so again, just this idea of being holy and being set apart. Um, you know, and you mentioned in your sermon this past week that's it's a both and. Right? If you're a Christian, you are holy. You you are holy and blameless. You stand before God without a single fault today, and yet holiness is something that you're living towards, mm -hmm. um, and you're striving towards at the same time. So, right. what uh what comes to mind when you think of and maybe how do you hold that tension of like, hey, you are holy. That's what you are, but you're also living in light of that you're trying to strive towards those things so. yeah i think it's um a lot of different analogies i like the the reason one of the reasons i wanted to use this passage is because the tree planted by the stream of water is really cool it's just the idea that the tree is there because god planted it there but it's only going to grow because he has fed it you know through mm -hmm. the streams of the water and the nourishment but also I know there's a lot of different illustrations i read one one time about um talking about the balance about a kid practicing the piano and they were just drudgery to him. Like he's like, my mom's making me do this. And yeah, I want to be able to play the piano with this is hard work. And then he had to go fall asleep and has his dream. This is just an illustration, obviously a made up story, but this idea like, what if, you know, he can look forward 30 years, he's like playing in this, you know, grand theater, like with all these people curious, like if he could see that, then the drudgery of practicing the piano, it's, it's, it makes more sense. He's like, okay, I am so I, I'm I am a world famous piano player. Like I'm 30 years before anybody else knows that, but that's what yeah. I am. And so practicing is just something I do out of out of who I am, and it's joyful. Mm. That's a little bit fall. That's a that's a, that falls short of really talking about the glory and the, the holiness that we have. But but it's kind of the same thing. Like we truly grasp the holiness of God and then grasp the fact that in Christ that is what describes us that we are holy mm -hmm. then it's not drudgery it's not religion it, you know it's not something that um, we we say oh, I gotta be holy today it's this idea of like here's what I am yeah. and so why would I want to pursue anything else why would I want to live under any other identity why would I want to be driven by anything else other than the fact that God has purified me redeemed me adopted me and so therefore my life is just in a response to that um, but there is still, I mean, I think, you know, the balance between what we are and what we do. I think the problem uh, is that sometimes we think that we're striving to reach holiness. And so that's what we have to understand. We're holy in Christ. But at the same time, we can't neglect the fact that the Bible is just clear all throughout it that we're called to walk in that, walk in the manner of that. So the balance is glorious. And it's life-giving. It's encouraging to say, I've already obtained a certain thing through Christ, like he on my behalf. Yeah. And so I'm not trying to earn something, but man, just what a blessing it is um, to get to walk in that. It says in First Peter, use your freedom to pursue Christ. Mm -hmm. And so we're holy, but we get to pursue the holiness that he's called us to. So it's really cool. And, and you know, I think that's a lot more can be said about it. That's a basic understanding of you are holy, but you're called to be holy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as your life pursued. Yeah, that's good. I think, you know, you said it like <clears throat> bringing up like, you know, I am like, mm -hmm. who, who am I? And, uh, like, you know, as you, as you shared that and as a, again, just through my reading too, like it made me think about like the prodigal son where, you know, after he runs and after he rejects the father and as he 
his life falls apart, like his identity, like he says, like, man, if I could just be a slave, right? If I could just be the scum of the earth, like it would just be there, but that like things would be great, things would be better. And then obviously, you know, like the father, you know, runs to him and puts the rubber on his shoulders and the ring on his finger. I know we've probably talked about that a million times, but like that's it's that moment where the son realizes like, man, I'm a, I'm a son. Like I belong. Like I'm in the family. I'm in the kingdom. And it's all because like the father did it right. The father, you know, the father did that like to and for the son and same goes for the Lord and, and us, right? Like God, like he said, like he makes us holy, like we're yeah. made holy mm-hmm. and God, God did that. And so I don't, I think like that question of like, who am I is like so important. And, and especially like in a in a day and age where people don't know people don't know what they are, right? Mm-hmm. Like people don't know what they're about, what they love, what I don't know, like what their goal or hope or motivation is. And man, like we just we're so quick to just find something to like be planted in and just mm-hmm. like find acceptance in. And, and I, I'm super guilty of that too, like just with my hobbies and things I've always done, you know. And so. And, I, and I've found myself, you know, you are talking about this, like, balance between, you know, who I am and then, you know, what am I doing? Like, who, you know, how do I approach holiness in my life, you know? Um, I've found that, like, <clears throat> I don't know, like, I can just, it, so it's really funny. I started using the, like, the Apple calendar, finally. I know you, hey, you probably told me that. Bro. <laughs> yes. So, just, yeah. it just takes me a couple of years until you tell me to use something and then I. Uh, so, you start giving me on our bills. Yeah. <laughs> is that one of those, the big desk ones that you like flip and write on? No, <laughs> that's no, the no, wall no. one. Oh, okay, no, 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 no. <laughs> that's a banana. Guy. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, so I like I started using that, and it's like, you know, I, I just noticed it's like, oh man, like I can do this Bible study, I can meet with this person, I can do this and this and this and this and this, and it's like I have a whole month full of holiness, right? But then it's like I. I, I tend to like forget of like, okay, well, why am I doing all that? Mm-hmm. That's good. Why am I filling my life up? And I know when you first got here, Gib, we, we read a book that focused a lot on that. You know, it's like, what what's my motivation for trying to achieve all this holiness? You know, because yeah. uh, I have felt at the end of those weeks or months to say, man, I'm like burnt out. Yeah. You know, I don't feel holy right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel kind of sick of God. Like I kind of, kind of don't want to read anymore, you know? Yeah. And so, like, that's kind of a check of, like, okay, well, why why am I trying to, like, achieve, or, you know, like, why am I trying to achieve holiness, or why am I trying to, like, do all of it rather than, like you said, a response, you yeah. know? And so, again, I hope that makes sense, but, like, just, man, just, like, resting in the fact that, man, the ring's on my finger, mm-hmm. you know? Like, I, I belong, and because of that, I, I want to be faithful with some things, like, with the things that I have, you yeah. know, mm-hmm. instead of, like... I gotta fill up every single day of my life with holiness so I can be holy. Yeah. That's, that's backwards. Yeah. I always think about the giving of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. It says, and God spoke all these things, saying, it says in verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then he begins the first of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. But there's this sense that, like, kind of like the Father does in that. Parable. It's like, hey, this is who I am. Um, this is who you are, and then this is what I've done. And in light of all of those things, be holy. Like, set yourselves apart for everybody else. But he doesn't do that until he reminds them, like, I am the Lord God. You are my people. I brought you out of slavery. So, you know, so quickly it's, I'm God, and here's the rules. Like, I, and I feel like that's where I can get to so fast. But it's like, okay. I know who God is, and I know what I'm supposed to do. Like you said, then I just fill my life up with those things that I'm supposed to do. But I'd never stop and remind myself, like, man, he's my God. Like, yeah. he, he's allowed me to be in his family, and he's delivered me out of slavery. Right? He's, he's brought me into his family. I'm an adopted kid into his family. And it's like, if I think in the times that I can stop and remind myself of that, then when the command is, you shall have another God before me, it's like, why would I? Mm-hmm. What has anything else done for me? Like, what else has delivered me from eternal slavery? You know, what what else has given me all of these wonderful things? What else has promised me all these wonderful things? Nothing else has. But, uh, you know, even the 
prodigal son. We talked about this yesterday a little bit. You know, even Genesis three, when um, you know the serpent comes and tempts Eve, like what what he's really doing is trying to get her to question God's character, not his laws. You know, now he obviously misquotes God, and and I I know all that. Like he he is trying to get them to disobey, but the first thing that that Satan does is he wants them to question God's goodness. Right? He wants them to say, you know, why would God keep that from you? And that's every sin we ever commit. Like, why why doesn't God want you to do that? Why doesn't God want you to just do whatever you want? Doesn't he love you? And, you know, when you begin to question God's goodness, it's like holiness is unattainable because you're never, you're certainly not going to humble yourself to a God you don't think loves you. Yeah. And you're not going to want to live a life that honors him if you don't think he cares for you. Um, yeah. yeah. So, I don't know, I, I love that, the giving of the Ten Commandments, just that he prefaces the commands with, you know, just a real quick, like, hey, I'm God, you're my people, I delivered you out of slavery, so you know I'm good. Yeah. Like, you know that, that my intentions for you are for you to prosper, for you to have good things, and for you to be loved and, you know, cared for in light of that. You know, don't have other gods because they're not, they don't love you. They haven't delivered you from slavery. Um, you know, don't covet what your neighbor has because that's not going to be good for you. So I don't know. Uh, but when I think about holiness, I always think, like, man, how does God give the Ten Commandments? He already sets up how that works. Um, just kind of in that same vein of, I want to make sure that I'm starting off my holiness campaign for the year with. Like, man, God really cares about who I am and about what's going on in my life. So That's awesome. That's good. Anything else? That's good stuff. Moving on. We're doing so good. Look at this new, this new year, new us, guys. Just oh, my God. Yeah. There we go. Drew has a shirt that says that. Does he? Yeah, That's new good. year, new awesome. me. Not. Yeah. <laughs> I think it says hashtag new year, new me. There you go. Yeah. Um, he wears it to Zoomies. But anyway. <laughs> I'll do that. You, you went too far. <laughs> All right. So we did humble, we did holy, and now we're going to do healthy. Uh, this is the last word. And again, this will be good sermon this week. Uh, but here's the here's the text. So we will give you a little precursor. This is Ephesians one fifteen through twenty one. It says, "For this reason, and this is of course Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers." that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the work of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Um, so this is Paul beginning this letter, kind of telling him, hey, here's, here's the core of spiritual health. You know, this is what this looks like. Um, so what you got? It's a continuation of the first two, mm -hmm. uh, but it's really the kind of the ongoing work of the first two. So we are humble before the Lord, which then allows us to understand his mercy, which leads to our holiness. And, you know, an accurate description of holiness is, as we said last week, conformity and closeness to Christ um, as God has displayed his full holiness. But here, Paul explains, like, more details about what does that look like ongoing? You know, when he prays, he says, I pray that you, um, you know, that you have the spirit of wisdom, revelation and knowledge of him, that your, your eyes be opened and your heart enlightened, that you know the hope, that it's not just a theological doctrine to you, that you know it, that you live it, that you're growing, uh, that the riches that you possess are the glorious inheritance of the saints and based on the immeasurable greatness of his power. So it's just kind of the only, the only like it's the hope for the future. Like, you know, we're in a new year, which you know, we joke about that, but really, I mean, this is every day, this is every new morning, right? Every new season, every new week is this idea that, you know, the, the greatness of, of the inheritance of the saints, the glory of God, is what we look forward to. It, it, the fact that Christ is raised, seated at the right hand of the Father, is why we live and breathe and move and have our purpose. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's based in humility and holiness. But now, here, health is if these things are absolutely true of, of you personally and of our church corporately, then we're healthy. You know, we may not have 
buildings the way they need to be or the budget where it needs to be or you know, we've got problems but but if we're healthy according to what paul has just said man that's that's the goal mm-hmm. if we're not doing these things we're just playing games right we're just wasting time and so just kind of want to this sunday have a, a discussion about spiritual health about it it really should define you and be everything that's important to you mm. yeah i think i think with like that like looking at like the spiritual health side of my life right like you can you can like evaluate that like you can kind of like like inspect it to some sense like or like take an inside look mm-hmm. to to that you know and uh and i think that's something like i don't know like i, I think about like the psalm like psalm 139 it talks about like you know he's asking god to like search me <laughs> yeah. right like invade my heart invade my life right like just show me like you know what what's going on like what you know whether it's fear or, or faith or, or whatever you know just examine me you know when he, when he says that and so um i don't know like i, I just I, I like that a lot and i, I think you know with like verse 15 it, it kind of lays out like you know kind of a i guess like evidence of like being healthy right like how, like what does your faith in the lord look like and yeah. what does your love for the saints look like like I don't know. I think, you know, going back to what we're talking about, like holiness, it's like we can, I don't know, we can have so many definitions of what like being healthy is, right? Like, oh, I, I come to church every single Sunday. Yeah. That means I'm healthy. Right. Or, man, my kids know a hundred Bible verses. That means I'm, they're healthy or, or whatever, right? Like we can just have all these other impressive. stands. Yeah. Yeah. Impressive. That's yeah. a smart. smart mm. So, but again, like we can have so many different standards, but really like the standards simple, right? And I, I think we don't like that. <laughs> I know, like, for me, like, when it's just super clear, it's just like, well, that, that's more difficult almost because it's like, it's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's just simple or broad in a sense. But um, I don't know. I think, I think those two things, you can really, like, pause uh, occasionally and, and see, like, man, like how, how have I been faithful to the Lord, yeah. right? How, how have I loved my brothers and sisters in Christ? Like, what's that look like? You know, it's just... The fruit, like you know, you can just kind of examine that, and so um, I don't know. You can just it just shows you what's really going on in your heart and in your life. Yeah, yeah. I think it's you know, it's crazy. You think about him writing this to the Ephesian church, and just it's funny how and you you were mentioning it like how we measure spiritual health and all those kinds of things. Like if like if you couldn't apply whatever measurement you're using to this church, it's not a good one. Mm-hmm. You know, so you talk about like scripture memorization. Well, they don't even have a full Bible at this point, mm-hmm. right? And there's a really yeah. good, really good chance that most of them are not gonna be able to get their hands on an Old Testament. You know, like there's their handwritten scrolls. It's not like everybody has an Old Testament in their house that they can just sit down and read with their kids. And you know, most of it's just verbal. Like they're just telling their kids about the Lord. They're telling their yeah. kids about His faithfulness. And you know, I think a lot of this is like God does this in your life. Like that's what He does when you get to know him is he illuminates this love for the Lord and he illuminates this love for his people. Um, and it is, it's so simple. It's like, how much grace are you showing people? How much mercy are you showing people in your church? Um, you know, are you doing it cause you love the Lord? Like those are way better questions than how's the checklist. No. You know, how, no. how are these things going? Have you read the book? You know, have you done the thing? Have you given the money? You know, are you volunteering in children's or youth or whatever? You know, not what are you doing? What do you love? Mm-hmm. Like, what do you love and how do you love it? <clears throat> yeah. Um, those are good questions. Yeah. And even like when Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Like, that's a way harder question for Peter to answer than, yeah. you know, would you die for me? Which is ironic. Like, of course, Peter would have said at one point, I would totally yeah. die yeah, for you. Yeah. But it didn't matter, you know. Yeah. That's good. Um, but yeah, I, I think the spiritual health part of it is so... It's just an interesting thing because you could you could go to so many different places. You could go, you know, ten hours north of here, if not that far, but it may look completely different at a church that's the exact same size as ours, the exact same denomination. Um, it just is in a different place, right? With different things going on and different struggles and you know different seasons of life that people are in. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody at lunch today just about uh, when me and Kareth. We've been married like a year. We had Bradley. I had two jobs. Like 
our definition of what what spiritual health looked like was so different. Um, it looked a lot more like survival than than it does now. Like there was just a different standard. There was different things going on in our lives, things we were dealing with. Um, you know, if, if I were to put it to like a checklist, it would look way different then than it does now. But this is so much easier. Like, man, were we loving the Lord? Were we loving the saints? That's a great question. Like, you could just stop right there. Yes. You know, where was our yeah. hope? Uh, not so much, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about this a lot with discipleship. Like, man, if you're a single mom with two kids, discipleship's going to look way different for you than if you're, you know, 21 and single. Yeah. You could disciple maybe 10 people then, but if you've got two kids by yourself, the chances of you being able to disciple one person, that's going to be, it's going to be hard. Um, giving, same thing. It's like, man, it may be really easy for some of us to write a check and maybe really hard for others. Like, it's just this idea that yeah. the checklist is a terrible way to go about figuring out whether or not you're healthy or not. But, uh, anyway, any closing thoughts on, on these three things? It's good stuff. Hope we can just continue to have these conversations throughout the year, throughout the rest of our lives, but really just wanted to have this opportunity to start the year with humble, holy, and healthy. It describes us, but it also drives us. Yeah. It really is what's important. Yeah. Yeah, I think, like, for me, just, you know, challenging me to just I don't know, look look deep into what my motivations are yeah. and what yeah. what am I functioning on and uh, and then just I don't know I, I just I humble you know I, I love I just love that like again Luke, Luke seven just find finding I don't know who who Christ is in that and uh, just trying to respond. <laughs> to that yeah. all right well next week like I said we've got a question about uh, conflict and how you deal with conflict um, both in the church and just amongst believers and so we'll spend some time talking about that that'll be fun maybe we'll stage a fight between Andrew and somebody we can just live stream it oh, um, so <laughs> I don't know just pick a guy <laughs> just, just pick a guy we can, we can each pick one person to fight with and we can then we can break them down yeah, different responses to it. Exciting. I know. Let's come back next week for. <laughs> um, so excited about that. We'll talk about just conflict and, and kind of how we deal with unity and, and tension and all that at the same time, and then uh, we'll go from there. But uh, thanks again for joining us. As always, if you don't have somewhere you're going to church, you're not plugged in. We'd love to have you for Bible study at nine fifteen, uh, service at ten thirty in the venue. Uh, as always, thanks for listening. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, if not, then hopefully we'll see you tomorrow night when the night start back up. If not, we'll see you Sunday.